Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Profitable Rental Podcast by Landlord Studio, where we explore the six building blocks of real estate profitability to help you maximize and grow your rental portfolio. I'm Logan Ransley, the co-founder of Landlord Studio, a property management and accounting software designed for small to medium-sized portfolio landlords, particularly ones that self-managing. In this episode, we want to explore real estate tax laws, the major tax deductions landlords need to sort of track and how landlords can maximize their savings during tax season. And this is uh, particularly relevant as the extensions are coming up soon. We want to explore that with Amanda Hamp and Matt McFarland. They're both the founders and directors of Keystone CPA. Great to have you on here uh, today, Amanda and Matt. Yeah, thanks for having us, Logan. Appreciate it. You're not only sort of accomplished tax strategists, but you're also seasoned real estate investors. And it sounds like you've spent a lot of time helping real estate investors in the market with both that sort of tax strategy. And you've also written a highly acclaimed book through the Bigger Pockets channel as well, the tax strategies for savvy real estate investors and been featured across multiple top publications actually. So really looking forward to having uh, you both on here today and, and learning a little bit more from both of you. Love to do a, a little bit of an intro, maybe tell us something about yourself, what's your favorite quote, how long have you been in Keystone, maybe give us a little bit of background on yourselves. Sure, yeah, well again, thank you for having us, appreciate the opportunity. I'm Matt McFarlane, this is my wife and business partner Amanda Hahn. We've both been in the industry for over 20 years. Uh, we started Keystone 15 years ago, actually. So we had our 15 year anniversary this year. Most of the clients, you know, our firm specializes in working with real estate investors and it's kind of on the tax planning and the tax compliance side of things and doing a lot of, you know, proactive tax planning to kind of help them save their taxes. But yeah, I mean, I'd say probably 85, 90% of our clients are involved in real estate in some extent, whether it's kind of working the W2 job and investing passively on the side or runs the gamut to doing real estate full time, you know, whether it's fix and flip or just rental property investors, what have you, you know. And we're in a unique situation because we are, you know, I tell people we are CPAs by day and real estate investors by night. <laughs> uh, so like a lot of people in our audience, you know, we're always working on our, on our own portfolio as well. You know, we're really fortunate to be able to be in a space where we can help others build wealth by sharing what we know, but we also get to learn a lot from our clients too, who are doing different types of real estate and all across the US. And really be able to see kind of firsthand what happens when things go well, where are the properties that are making money so it's been a great journey so far yeah that's amazing and um, I've heard a lot from the sort of industry about real estate investors looking for CPAs that have particular focus on real estate tax because there might be a lot of generalist sort of CPAs that don't have any experience in real estate investing and they might provide sort of general advice and general tax advice but it's always great to have somebody who is actively investing in real estate, managing properties, because I think it makes that sort of relationship so much better. Wanted to sort of jump straight into the crux of, you know, tax deductions. Very juicy topic. People love this stuff. <laughs> How about you sort of start us off and explain about sort of real estate tax deductions and how they work for landlords? Because I think, I mean, this is a pretty big topic, but particularly for those who are just getting into the game and just starting out their journey, why are they important? What's the sort of general overview? What should they be considering? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the biggest mind shifts when it comes to newer real estate investors and taxes is understanding that as a real estate investor, we really can take advantage of, of most of the same tax benefits, write-offs, and tax perks that are available to business owners. And the reason for that is, in the eyes of the IRS, a real estate investor is a business owner. Uh, and by business, I don't mean like an LLC or a corporation, I just mean you're in the business of earning real estate income, right? So generally speaking, rental income. For someone who might be new to real estate, uh, maybe still working a full-time job as a W-2, this will be the first time when you can actually start to take advantage of the benefits of write-offs and depreciation and all those other things that traditionally uh, you weren't able to get, get a benefit from because the sole income was W-2. 
Yeah, I think, you know, from from the perspective of investing in rental real estate, I mean, one of the, obviously the goals that, you know, we all like is cash flow positive properties, right? But there's so many things within the tax world and tax strategies and things you can implement that even if you're cash flow positive where you're, you're receiving checks, you know, on paper from a tax return perspective, you might even break even or have a loss for tax purposes. So the, the benefit of that to the investor is just, you know, you're getting cash in your pocket, but not having to pay taxes right now. So that, that can be a huge win for, for an investor for sure. And what are some of those sort of, you know, key tax deductions? that landlords should be looking out for? What are some of the most common ones that they can utilize to mitigate sort of tax bills effectively? I feel like most investors are really great at capturing their property specific expenses. And by those, I mean, you know, mortgage interest, property taxes, maybe management fees, repairs, right? Everyone's usually pretty good about those things. But what we find most investors miss out on are overhead real estate expenses. So some of those things that are maybe personal in nature, but we're also utilizing it for real estate purposes. So an example could be a car, right? So you, as a real estate investor, you're using your car, uh, not just driving to the properties, but also maybe driving to go to Home Depot, driving to go to the bank, driving to meet with your CPA or your attorney. These are all legitimate business uses of a car. If you're tracking those expenses, part of that personal car could become a legitimate business tax deduction. And a similar concept goes for a home office. You know, most investors work from their home office. Very few investors actually go out and rent an office space just to manage their rental properties. So a lot of people often miss out on that opportunity, either because they're given wrong advice or that they are told that, you know, these are big audit risks that you should stay away from. So I think really important to understand as an investor, we're not just limited to our property specific expenses, but other expenses too that we're incurring because we are investing in rental real estate. You mentioned about the the vehicle sort of tax deductions and I'm quite surprised at how few people deduct mileage for instance off their vehicle but a automatic mileage detector sort of product in our and in, in landlord studio but there's very few people that sort of actively see that as a, a tax deductible expense and actually it's probably quite a high tax deductible expense so I think just sort of bringing light onto that that all these sort of aspects are quite that they can be deducted from your tax bills is quite important important. Partly that people don't know what they can deduct. Some of the times they're just maybe not as organized as they should be. So they just kind of, you know, I'll get around to that. And then time six months goes by and they haven't gone back to tallying it up. I mean, but yeah, to your point, I mean, with auto expenses, that's a huge one. You can, we know we can deduct either the, the mileage expense or if we add up all of our actual costs and which can include depreciation of the vehicle, that ends up being more than the mileage. We can take that deduction instead. So definitely can be thousands of dollars that people leave on the table, unfortunately, every year. And you mentioned depreciation very sort of briefly just before. I think this is a significantly underestimated or un- not very understood sort of tax deduction. So how about you sort of explain really generally or briefly what sort of depreciation is and, and how landlords can leverage this to really maximize tax savings? It's a great question because that's probably one of our favorite deductions, obviously, in the tax world. I mean, I, I like to joke that it's like the ninth wonder of the world because we call it a paper write-off that the IRS allowed gives people every year. So perfect scenario, you know, you're a landlord and you bought a you know 20 unit building obviously you're buying it for cash flow you're buying it for the property to appreciate in value but in the irs's eyes because of normal wear and tear they think it's going down in value so they let you write off a portion of the purchase price of the building every year against your income from the property we know you know buy a million dollar property put a hundred thousand dollars down depreciation is based on a million bucks your starting point is a million dollars not just your hundred thousand dollar down payment so that's why i call it a paper write-up because it's not money that you're spending every year so it could be one of those things i was talking about earlier where you could have cash flow positive but with enough depreciation and other things, that's eliminated all your cash flow that you don't have to pay tax on. So it's a, it's a huge thing that, you know, it's a difference between investing in rental real estate versus stocks, right? Like you buy stocks, you're not writing off the cost of the stock until you sell it, you know, five, 10, 15 years down the road, you know? Yeah, what I, I think that what I also love about depreciation is that it is available to all types of real estate investors. And so we always hear this confusion where people say, oh, I can only take depreciation if I do real estate full time or if I am a real estate professional. Right. And that's not true at all. Anybody who invests in rental real estate are able to take depreciation and depreciation can, like Matt said, offset rental income every single year. Further, depreciation 
decision is, is not dependent upon just how much money you put into a specific deal. Um, it's actually the starting point of depreciation tax calculation is the purchase price of a building. Even if you have a property where you put very little money down or no money down, the depreciation tax benefit is potentially still very significant because of the fact that you start with the purchase price of the building. It almost seems quite counterintuitive, really, that the IRS sees it as a depreciation asset, but we're investing in it because it's going to go up in value. We also get these sort of terminologies or these, these words thrown around like bonus depreciation, depreciation recapture, accelerated depreciation. Do you think you could kind of go into that a little bit and sort of explain some of those terminologies in, in the layman's terms and how they sort of fit within this tax strategic planning, I guess? Yeah, I mean, so depreciation depreciation is just you know the traditional in the traditional sense is the IRS allowing you to write off a portion of that building purchase price over time so for residential real estate typically you can write it off over 27 and a half years for commercial real estate typically over 39 years and so that just meaning kind of slow and steady every year I'll take a little bit of depreciation accelerated depreciation it's often called cost segregation it just means that you have a study that's done on the specific building where you can then break out the components of that building so instead of just saying I have one building depreciated over 27 and a half years we're gonna have these different components of the building that I can depreciate much much faster and so to the extent I can write off more faster that means I'm saving tax dollars sooner rather than later and that's where you you know when you hear investors talk about wow I invest in real estate and you know I wrote off 30 50 hundred thousand dollars odds are they're talking about using accelerated depreciation to create those tax savings and then of course you know when you sell your properties down the road if you don't do a 1031 exchange or something then there could be depreciation recapture you know, when you sell a property on the road, you have to calculate gain or loss on sale for tax purposes. And that's the difference between your sales price and what they call your basis in the property. And for tax purposes, that's really the purchase price minus the depreciation that you've already taken. Because you've already expensed that, so you've already gotten the benefit. So, you know, if your basis was 300 to begin with and you took 100,000 of depreciation, now it's a 200. So if you sell it for, what, I don't know, 400,000 our example, you have $200,000 of gain. The first 100 represents depreciation recapture because it's, you know, represents that, that amount of expense you already got. Only thing for, you know, really people would be, you know, they, they tax you a little bit more than the capital gains, but generally speaking, people come out ahead to have them taken the depreciation up front and, you know, if they have to recapture, you know, five, 10 years down the road. And have you seen some sort of successful case studies or scenarios, maybe with your own clients or others, where they've used cost segregation for accelerated depreciation? And also, are there any sort of examples of when most beneficial to use a strategy like that? Because I'd imagine that you'd use it in a very specific sort of strategy if you're trying to sell or buy or expand. Or when, when, when and where have you sort of seen that most used? Yeah, it's really important, I think, for, for investors to understand that cost segregation is not the right solution for every single person. It's very investor specific. And so the question becomes, you know, who is cost segregation a benefit for? Uh, who is it a good idea for? So I think the two main criteria is one, that you have enough real estate income or passive income that this accelerated depreciation will help you to offset that type. Or the other scenario could be where you are able to use the rental losses that's generated from this income, maybe because you're a real estate professional. Because at the end of the day, the, we only want to do accelerated depreciation if you are able to utilize it in the year that you create this deduction. Oh, did you have anything to add to that, Matt? There's certain scenarios where it makes sense. It's not a one size fits all, but it can fit very different price prop. Years ago, it was like a lot of people said, hey, the property's got to be, the building purchase price got to be $500,000 or more. Nowadays, with you know bonus depreciation and things of that nature, we've seen cost segs for, I don't know, $150,000, $200,000 buildings, even pencil out, depending on people's own tax situation. You know, looking at cost benefit, that kind of thing, you know? Just sort of looking at your overall client base or perhaps another person's client base, are there any sort of examples of you have seen where costly tax mistakes have really had an impact on investors sort of growth plans and journeys you don't have to give names uh, how, much, how much time you have <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming these guys have uh, done it before they came to see you 
I mean, they're kind of the mistakes we see. You know, we see a lot of people's taxes, obviously, and the mistakes can vary, obviously. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking back to one from years ago where she was trying to get loans on on properties to pay off a tax bill. And new client to us go and look at her tax returns, and she had a dozen properties, maybe, owned them for 10 years. And no joke, I mean, she had not taken depreciation expense on any of the properties for like 10 years. To us, obviously, that's like tax 101, right? You, you have a rental property, you get depreciation expense. And so, I mean, that's an extreme example, obviously, but there's situations like that. There's times where people have done cost segregation studies where it wasn't the right scenario for them to do it. So they've paid somebody to do a calculation. They've created all this extra expense that they can't use because their income is too high. They want a real estate professional. They didn't have positive income from their rentals. So all they've done is pay extra money to kind of create this bucket of unused rental losses that's just going to carry forward and kind of be, you know, stuck to be only used in a certain way going forward, not, not, not in the best use of their money for sure. I think that one mistake I see a lot of investors make is not having the right record keeping or bookkeeping. You know, when you hear people talk about like, hey, I hate taxes, I hate doing taxes. Really, I think what most of that stems from is having bad record keeping. And then you're kind of thinking like, man, I got to now go through my receipts and my bank statements. But for most investors, if they have a good system in place to do record keeping, usually at tax time, there's not that kind of level of stress, right? Because you kind of already know what your numbers are. And I would go one step further to say that to truly save on taxes and to have a good tax plan in place, the foundation of it is to have good books because if you don't have good books then you don't know where your starting point is we don't know what numbers we're working with and so you know, sometimes investors will say hey I sold a flip property I think I made a hundred thousand dollars when in fact they might have only made ten thousand dollars and that could be a very significant difference in terms of what are the strategies we're looking at to reduce the tax or they you know they think they only made ten grand and they made fifty thousand dollars in profit you know that's <laughs> goes both ways. We actually see this big spike in uh, registrations on our platform happen in January, February of every single year and right before October tax deadline extension as well. So <laughs> just goes to show that people were sort of scrambling last minute to get all their books in order. Uh, <laughs> which is amazing to me. Yeah, and I think it's so important, you know, like you said, to have a, like, have a system in place, right? So it's, I think people start out with the right intentions in January. Like, I'm going to sign up, I'm going to do this. But really important thing for all investors to just keep up the momentum. You know, it's always much easier to record and track your expenses from last week than it is to try to record and track things that you did six months ago. And as we sort of go towards tax season or the extension and then going into next year, what are some of the sort of best practices, actionable steps that you would suggest or advise to landlords um, so that they can make sure they're well prepared? True tax savings comes with tax planning and not just tax return filing. So contrary to popular belief, when you're meeting with your CPA in April is not the right time to plan for how to save on taxes for last year's income. So as we go, you know, for the duration of this year, it's really important to take some time to meet with your tax advisor and try to figure out how to use some strategies to save on taxes. Yeah, it's always good to have that open line of communication, you know, especially coming up on year end. Is just get do some year end tax planning. It's a great time to kind of have that conversation with your tax advisor. What has happened over the past year? What are you planning to do in the coming year? What are some moves that I can may still make this year to kind of reduce taxes? And you don't need to be a CPA, obviously. Just have an open line of communication with just sharing what's going on and what is going to happen, and ask the questions and have that open dialogue. I think is really powerful. Great segue into my final question, which is where can the audience find more about your services and where can they find you? I think for people who are looking for additional uh, tax strategies or ways you can reduce taxes through planning, our website is probably the best place, keystonecpa.com. We have a lot of great information. We actually have a free downloadable tax savings toolkit where we talk about a lot of these different strategies and there's actually a self-assessment tool for those of you who are trying to figure out whether or what your risks are in terms of overpaying in taxes. If you're looking for kind of daily tax tips, the best place to find me is on Instagram as Amanda Han CPA. And sometimes I'm in the background of her Instagram posts. Just that's, that's where I am. And also check out that book as well. 
other tax strategies for savvy real estate investors. That's it for today's episode of the Profitable Rental Podcast. I hope everyone has learned a, a few tips and tricks to make sure that engage with the CPA to make sure that they're getting the best tax strategy as well. So I appreciate you coming on today, Amanda and Matt. And yeah, thank you for joining us again and, and sharing your valuable insights on real estate tax and deductions. If you like this episode, make sure you give it a like, give it a share, subscribe to our channel, keep up to date with that. Make sure to check out Amanda and Matt on social channels and their website as well. And also follow us on social media as well. Just look for Landlord Studio on all platforms. Stay tuned for the next one. We'll be diving deeper into tax and deductions. So until then, have a great day. Cheers. Thank you.